Okay, so today I'm doing a recap of um, a project I built with a couple of coworkers from my last company at Spawnfest. Um, so let's get started. So we kind of already introduced who I am. Uh, I was a software engineer at Corvus Insurance up until like last week. Um, <laughs> at, at Corvus, we used uh, Elixir, Elm, and um, that would become very relevant for this talk. Uh, in my free time, I do have a YouTube channel with uh, a friend, uh, Code Next Door, where we interview functional programming language creators and go over uh, functional programming concepts. So what is SpawnFest? Uh, SpawnFest is a really cool hackathon that everyone here should participate in next year because it's fun. Uh, but essentially, uh, you have to use a technology that runs on the beam. So Erlang, Clo Clojure, um, Gleam, Elixir, uh, you, you name it. If it's on the beam, you can use it. Uh, the other condition of SpawnFest is it's only 48 hours. So you have 48 hours to build something on the beam. Uh, this past year, there were 31 teams and 42 players from all over the world. So it was quite the competition. So the project that I'm talking about today, I, I just didn't build it by myself. It was um, done in coordination with some coworkers, uh, Andre and Justin. And this is sort of like the cartoon representation of ourselves. <laughs> So today I'm going to cover like the ideation process of the project we built, uh, how we went into design and planning, and sort of the developer journey through the entire thing, like using external libraries, uh, gen servers, a little bit of prompt engineering, and talking through the dependency issues that we ran into, and a small demo of what we ended up building. So this whole thing kind of started because I was helping a nonprofit kind of redo their website. And I didn't start the nonprofit or help them in the beginning. So of course, they use Wix to get a website up and running. And everyone loves Wix, right? Like, <laughs> so you're, you're trying to get, you know, like a button to click and work. And you're like, oh, I need to open up this menu and move this over here. Uh, this is just so frustrating. But yeah. So I was thinking it would be great if I could just talk to an AI and tell it what I want it on the website, and then the AI would just go and do that thing. So hence this idea was born of building like a textile web app type of thing. Uh, so we called it Elm Spark, and I'm a really big fan of Kids Next Door, so we had to come up with an acronym type name. Uh, and Elm Spark stands for Elm Software Produced by AI um, Responsive Knowledge. So uh, I go to my coworker, Justin, and I'm like, okay, this, this is the overall idea that I have. Um, I want to use Elm to get an AI to write Elm code that then gets uh, compiled to JavaScript, which is the website. And I was just doing, going through like a couple of uh, like high level ideas that we need for the project to get this running. So it was like, okay, we need an ability to save Elm files on the server. We need the ability to compile files with Elm. Uh, we need to be able to take input from like the user to describe the website that they want to build. And we need to pass that to some large language model and get this feedback loop going where it actually builds a web application. And Justin responded like, yeah, that, that seems about right. And here's some other stuff that we need to, maybe a, a wrapper around our large language model, um, some loggers for the streams, and like the ability to actually see the page that's generated. Um, so once we kind of had that, we, we had a big kind of goal of what we wanted to build. And this is generally what it looks like. So the first step is the user would submit a blueprint, and ChatGPT takes that blueprint, writes some Elm code, sends it to the Elm compiler, and maybe it compiles or maybe it sends us back some errors. Uh, and then ChatGPT takes that error uh, and writes more Elm code until it compiles. And then hopefully we go through this whole process, and the user gets an Elm app at the end like the website, without having to click on any complicated Wix buttons, yeah. So how do we go about building this? Fast, very, very fast. I mean, we only had 48 hours, remember. So the, the first step is the user has to submit the blueprint. But, well, before we start anything, you have to set up your developer environment, 
right? Um, and we didn't use our work laptops. We all used our personal computers. So of course, we had to reinstall everything and make sure things were working. And the first issue we ran into, uh, we got our repository from the SpawnFest organizers. And we pushed up, and we realized that we have Eric Dubois as a contributor on our repo. And we're like, who the heck is Eric Dubois? And so for the next 20, 30 minutes of like the beginning of SpawnFest, we're like, what's wrong with our environment setup? And come to find out, Andre, uh, he was using like default uh, settings and like I think his Vim setup, and that's where the name Eric Dubois came from. So, so we're trying to figure out, are we in trouble? Are we going to get disqualified? We didn't put Eric Dubois like on any of our paperwork or anything. So we contact the, uh, the organizers. They're like, no, 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 you're fine. Just start coding. We're like, OK, cool. So the next thing we ran into, uh, we write some code, and we immediately realize like, the language server is not working. Why the heck is the language server not working? We're not going to be able to code anything without a language server. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're figuring out that, oh, we actually need to install the correct version of Elixir. And then, boom, things, things work. Uh, so that took us to our next problem that we had to solve, is getting the correct version of Elixir. Um, turns out you don't want to use the uh, bleeding edge version. It, it doesn't, it's not a good idea. Um, so after we got our environment, like, our dev environment set up, then, then we actually went back to the, the problem at hand. Like, what is a blueprint? So we came up with this idea that a blueprint would be the title of your web application, a description of what that web app is supposed to do, and acceptance criteria. You can kind of think about this as like QA instructions. You're like, you should be able to click on this button and uh, an X appears on the screen. You're like, OK, I think that's enough information for the large language model to actually try to build a map reasonably. So the next step after we figured out what a blueprint is, we we're trying to figure out, well, how the heck does ChatGPT write Elm? We, we can't just ask it to just write an entire module on its own. I mean, we did try that. It, it did not work. <laughs> so we're like, how do we do this? What's, what's the plan here? Um, so we started thinking about just what Elm code kind of is. Uh, and Elm, for, for people who are not familiar, you have this notion of an Elm program. And to get an Elm program, you need three things, essentially. You need a function that defines the view, like what you actually see. You need a function that defines the init, so like the initial state of your program. Uh, and you need a function that defines uh, update. So when some event happens, how do you want to change the state of your program. Once you have those three functions, uh, you essentially have an Elm program, and it compiles to a web app, and everything's nice. So we need ChatGPT to write an Elm program. Um, but we can't just ask it to write it all at one time, because that's like too hard for the large language model right now. So we came up with this idea. Um, in Elm, you have this concept of debug.todo. And it essentially just allows you to have holes through your program that aren't like written yet, um, while you can focus on other things. So utilizing this whole debug dot to do, we realized that we could add pieces of the program at a time, and just focus on the one piece that we're trying to add. So the the first thing that we want to add to our program is what the model is for the program. So like, what state does it actually contain, and what are those types? Um, and we use like a kind of shell idea where we have everything that's needed for this program to compile except for this one small piece. And then we run that through the compiler with the debug.todo, and the compiler either passes or fails. Uh, and if it passes, then we move on to the next step. Um, and on the next step, we take the code that ChatGPT uh, wrote with that the small slither, and then we add it to the overall shell of the program. And we kind of just do this for the entire program until we have no more holes in our program. Um, so we kind of call it this concept sort of like uh, Elm shell programming, because we're just like, well, we need a shell that works. And then we need the AI to come in and add just a little bit to cover that shell. Um, so that's how the whole kind of process of ChatGPT writing Elm, we said, should work in theory. So at this last step, um, 
at this last step, we have like pretty much no more shell, uh, and we only have the last bit, which is the view code. And then ideally, if that compiles, then we have a full Elm program that compiles. Um, so we have our plan on how like ChatGPT is going to write Elm code, uh, and that's pretty much like the the whole like basis of the project. So now it's just like, all right, how are we actually going to go and build this? And um, I like to build software kind of using the shape up philosophy. And it, there's a lot of different things to shape up, but the whole idea is you want to figure out what you're doing in like the first half of your sprint, uh, ideate, build like prototypes. And then once you kind of realize what problem you're working with, uh, you want to kind of refine on it and, and get the work done. So since we already had 48 hours for this hackathon, we kind of split our um, our dev into 24 hour like portions. So for the first 24 hours, we're figuring out what we need to do to actually get all this working. And at the, the halfway point, we want to have that idea and then just get it all working, get it all done and refined. So in this first part, we haven't started development yet. We have our idea. So we're going to be running up the hill of the shape up hill that I just showed you, like figuring out what's needed. Um, so this starts like the dev journey. So we know that we need a way to talk to a large language model. Uh, and we also know that we need a way to actually compile Elm. Um, so we, we tackled the, the first part with an external library, uh, xopenAI. It's like really easy to get um, your API calls to OpenAI if you just use this library. So that solved that problem super easy. Didn't take any time, really. Uh, and then the next thing we, know we need is the Elm interaction. And we were just thinking, OK, we just need to call an Elm binary and run it. So we can just use system command. That, that, that should be easy, right? So um, when we were running through the system command and figuring out like what we actually need for Elm to compile, we're realizing, like, oh, it's not as easy as just like doing Elm make or like Elm compile or whatever. We actually need to set up the dev environment for compiling and writing Elm code. So what does Elm need to compile? The, the first thing it needs is an Elm project initialized. Uh, and the way that you do that is you just type in Elm init to your terminal, and it will create an Elm project for you with these files and a folder set up. Um, so we're just thinking that should just be system command Elm init, right? Wrong. <laughs> so for whatever reason, uh, this did not work. And we were all kind of stumped by it like really stumped by it. <laughs> so it took us like two, two and a half hours just trying to figure out, okay, how do we initialize our Elm project here? Like I can do it in the terminal, it's just Elm init, but why can't, you know, Elixir do it for me? <laughs> and the reason is, well, pipes. Uh, Elm init, it expects you to say like why or yes uh, after you type in Elm init. And we just really didn't think about that. We were just like, oh yeah, the program would just run Elm init. And then Elixir never did anything. We were like, oh, this is broken. And the whole reason is we need to pipe yes to the Elm init function, uh, not function, but uh, command. So after we figured that out, then it started actually producing uh, an Elm project for us. So this is what we ended up with. Um, system command takes bash, uh, and then we just echo y to the pipe of Elm init, and then boom, magic, it works. So. After we have the Elm project initialized, the other thing that we need to actually write Elm is, well, an Elm file. So we have to just create that uh, using file write. And this actually worked the first time. Um, so that didn't take any time at all. And lastly, uh, to get the compilation working, we need to run Elm make. And that's just uh, Elm's version of the compiler just running. And you just type in Elm make and then the name of your file. So we have. The Elm project initialized using the pipe magic. We have a, a main Elm file written using file.write. And then we are trying to run Elm make uh, and we'll use system command. And of course, that didn't work. <laughs> um, so I got really frustrated. And it's like maybe 2, 3 AM at this point. And I'm like, ah, I could spend more time trying to figure out how to like, run binaries, or I could just use a library. 
So if you're not familiar with Rambo um, and you need to run like some process from Elixir, just use Rambo. It's, it's really lovely, easy. Uh, you can just do Rambo run and treat your commands just like you do in the terminal. And that's what we did to kind of get past this problem. So Rambo allows you to run external processes, chain commands, and it handles all the weirdness of processes uh, in Elixir. Uh, I had no idea at the time that uh, it went very deep in how you can run a process uh, from Elixir. So we kind of figured out the Elm part of things. And now I'm going to kind of show you some code. Uh, let's see. So we have uh, on the left, let me just make this easier to see. Um, we have here our, our large language model, like implementation. Um, so Justin was just like, we can't just use X open AI directly. That's a bad practice. What if we decide to switch it out later? So he was like, we have to build a wrapper module around this. Um, so we just alias the X open AI chat module, and we created our own functions for calling that module. Uh, so Really simple code. Um, it just uses the library. Um, and then, for the creation of like the Elm project and like doing all the compilation steps, we actually created a gen server that will create a new project uh, and actually compile the project. And this is what that gen server looks like. So if we're trying to initialize an Elm project, we're checking to see first if we've already uh, initialized the project. If not, then we create a projects directory where we're storing our, our Elm projects. And here we are. And then when we actually want to compile our Elm files, we are checking in the directories that we have, and we format the code, and then we pass the arguments, uh, make, and the name of the file to Rambo run, and Rambo will either return an OK uh, blah tuple that says that the command ran successfully and there were no errors, or in other words, um, Elm compiled successfully, and in the other case, it returns a Rambo error, meaning that uh, the Elm program did not compile for whatever reason. Um, and I just showed you that. OK. So after we have, like, uh, we have a Phoenix page that accepts a blueprint from the user, uh, we're passing that content in the same format that I kind of showed you before, where we're writing um, the Elm program kind of piece by piece and asking ChatGPT just to focus on one piece. Uh, and then in our first pass of this, we kind of just got it working where ChatGPT writes Elm code. And we are constantly trying to write the same program over and over again. So essentially, the, the first pass, it was going through multiple passes until the entire thing compiled, uh, where it would restart if it failed at any step. Um, but this was like after 24 hours, like, this is pretty good. Like, we have ChatGPT writing Elm code. Um, but then we realized that, like, we needed to help it kind of write better programs. Um, so there were a couple of things that we had to do. Um, when it first started writing functions, it didn't actually know what functions it had access to. Uh, so it's just like, oh, I want to use list.map but list isn't imported, so that's not available, so the code's not compiling. Uh, and then we were just like, well, how do we tell it what it should have access to? So we had to add, actually add a step to our kind of shell process where we are um, asking ChatGPT to think about what modules it needs to import to solve this problem, at, like whatever the, the prompt was. So uh, that actually took a lot of effort. Um, <laughs> And the, the reason is, is that prompts can be very delicate. Large language models are looking for things and prompts that you really wouldn't expect. 
So uh, our first prompt, we were asking it to give us a list of modules that it would think is needed to, you know, compile the program. And it would give us a list of modules, but that list of modules didn't really make sense. It was almost like it was um, taking its training data and just spitting it back at us. And the reasoning was, is that we asked for it initially for as a, a list separated by commas. Um, so a list separated by commas, there are tons of lists separated by commas, like all over the place. Everyone writes comma separated list. So what it was doing, instead of actually answering our question, it was just like, oh, here's the beginning of a comma separated list that starts with like list comma. And now because I'm a next word predictor, I'm just gonna put HTML comma or array comma and just go on and on. And I think one time we even got Apple comma something else. You're like, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So um, we were noticing that it was picking up on the commas and just trying to autocomplete based on comma separated list. And we needed a way for it not to do that. So the next thing that we tried was separating it by the, the bar symbol. Uh, but then we realized that there's probably a lot of like data in, in the training data that is like half school code where it's just like bar separating things. And that didn't, that's not what we wanted. So eventually we landed on the at sign as the separator. Uh, and when we asked it to give us a list separated by the at sign, the double at sign, well, we know for a fact there are no double at sign separated lists in its training set. <laughs> well, we, at least we hope. <laughs> but that's when we uh, started to get really good results back. Um, so we learned like a, a lot about prompt engineering in that moment because it's just like your your prompt uh, really can influence like the response. So if your prompt isn't like um, vetted against like this is going to be in the training data a lot, then you're gonna have issues. So this is our in prompt that we ended with to get it to give us the modules. Uh, given the title, the description, and the user acceptance criteria, pick modules from the available modules that you need to build this project in Elm. Return the available modules that are separated by double ampersand. And your response should look something like this. And this was like perfect. It, it was giving us everything that we needed. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna show more code. So this is essentially our kind of the, the, the starter of the app, our shell program. Um, we take the first function uh, and it generates the imports that it needs for the modules, uh, what I was just kind of talking about. Uh, and then each subsequent function, it, it's working on a piece of, of functionality for the program. So the first step is we need to generate the imports, figure out what modules we want to have access to. And then given that module list, we actually want to generate the, the model for the program. Uh, and this attempt with mini function, it allows us to, instead of just having to go through the entire process one time and restarting if there's any failure uh, in any one of the steps, we actually can attempt uh, each one of these like different steps a certain amount of times and uh, constantly retry to get the correct output. Um, and I'll break down just one of the functions. So starting with the uh, an Elm program, which I will show you. Oops. So this is sort of like the expression of what an Elm program is in, in Elixir. So an, an Elm program has um, imports uh, which represent like the modules that are imported into that program. It has the model fields, which um, are essentially the type of the state of your program. It has the view, which is like what you actually see. Um, init is how you actually start the model. The messages are like the events that can happen um, to the web application. And then the update function is, well, update represents the update function, like how you update your state given those events. Uh, and then we have this notion of a stage. So 
to represent like which stage of the program we're at, like how much is developed, we just have a stage so that we know. Uh, and error uh, represents if we have an error in the program. And then the code is actually a generated field where we just combine all the different um, fields together and until we have the actual like full string version of the program. So this is sort of like the basis of everything, the, the Elm program. So the, the first step starts with creating a new Elm program, setting the stage to choosing imports, and then we call the large language model to get the imports um, based off of the available list of imports. Now, if the large language model returns um, OK, we should get an Elm program permit with imports now added. Um, if it doesn't return OK, then we have an error, and then the attempt with many function will try again to reproduce. So each function in this generation app function pretty much works the same. It sets the stage of the Elm program at whatever stage is at. It uses a custom prompt for that stage to go and try to get the code. And then if it returns OK, it moves on to the next um, generation stage. And if not, it will try to retry. Uh, yeah. So somewhere around the 25, 26 hour mark, we have the retry thing working successfully. So we start with some blueprint. ChatGPT tries to start writing some code. And then maybe it fails, but then it retries that stage and writes some more code. And then eventually it compiles. And then we get all the way through to a full working Elm app. So we're at the, the top of our shape uphill. We have users submitting blueprints. We have ChatGPT writing Elm code. And we have a user being able to see the actual Elm app that's produced. And then we even have this feedback loop going with ChatGPT. So now we're trying to figure out, well, what else do we need to do like to refine this? Like at this point, it looks ugly and like there's some other niceties about it that aren't working. So we're on the downhill of getting like the project done. And we only have like 24 hours left. So we decided that, well, we need to be able to style this thing. We should probably add documentation and deploying it somewhere so the judges can see it without having to like set up the local dev environment would, would be pretty important. So that's what we said was going to be on our downhill. And that's what we decided to do. Um, I feel like everyone's been here. I'm just going to deploy the code and it's going to work, right? Right? Just, just do fly deploy and it's super easy, right? <laughs> Wrong. Um, <laughs> so for the next like five, six hours of this hackathon, I'm trying to figure out why the heck isn't Elm compiling on the servers in Fly.io? Like it was just a really big mystery. And we were all scratching our heads. We're like, we got so far. We should have deployed in our first step, you know, after like the entire time. We should have deployed first because we would have ran into this and then we would have fixed it. But now it's like we have, uh, I think we had like 10, eight hours left of the hackathon. And we're like, oh no, it's still not working. <laughs> um, and the problem actually lies in Haskell. I had to um, look into the Elm code, Elm, the Elm compilers written in Haskell, and I found a snippet in the Haskell code, and it's looking for um, <laughs> an environment variable called Elm home. And that environment variable, of course, isn't set in, in Fly.io because why, why would I need that environment variable? That, that's not in the docs anywhere. And I'm, I'm looking in the Haskell code, I'm like, oh, okay, it's looking for Elm home, and it's not finding it, and therefore Elm can't run. Simple. So I open up an issue to the Elm compiler, and of, of, of course, nothing happened with that. So I just went and fixed the, uh, the Elm home. Like, I, I set the environment variable to something random, and, and next thing you know, voila, it, the, it, it, it works, and, and it's deployed. Um, I'm going to now show you all the app in all its glory. Uh, so this is like the, uh, a Phoenix Live View app, and we are asking the user to define the blueprint. 
and I already have one here for example purposes. So um, just a simple tic-tac-toe game. Um, and when you have the blueprint available, you can click Construct Blueprint, and then you go through this program viewer, um, and hopefully, or OK, cool, things are, things are working. So <laughs> at, at each step, uh, the AI is going out and asking ChatGPT, like, how do I build this? Um, like, what imports do I need? Uh, what a knit function should look like? What are the messages? And it did it really fast, but like, this is the fully uh, compiled program from ChatGPT. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit here, you'll see that we have these red like clocks turning at these two stages. And that essentially means that ChatGPT had to ask itself again, like how to improve uh, on this code to get it to compile. And the whole reason that we chose Elm as like the program to, to do this instead of like Elixir, for instance, is that the Elm compiler messages are really, really simple. Uh, and Elm is really, really simple. So like there isn't a lot of room uh, that the language model needs to think about to, in order to get a compiling program. So at each one of these, wow, <laughs> at each one of these steps, uh, the, with the red is ChatGPT asked itself, how do I improve from this, this current state uh, to get the compiling program? And then it went through that and it compiled. So we have a full-blown um, Elm program and if everything is working, which I don't think it is, <laughs> we should be able to go back and actually look at what it made. Ah, we, we have something. Now, as you can see, that's not a tic-tac-toe game. But, <laughs> but it's words on the screen.